In 1996, Amkus released the game Bokujo Monogatari for the Super Famicom system. The game saw moderate success in its native Japan, but struggled to find an audience abroad under the name Harvest Moon. Still, it was enough to get a follow-up greenlit, and thanks to a passionate fan base, would go on to lay the foundation of what would become the cozy game genre. One of those passionate fans was Eric Barone, better known as Concerned Ape. Inspired by the series, he would spend nearly half a decade building Stardew Valley, in which he hoped to address what he felt were the shortcomings of his beloved series. He took one look at the cute characters of Harvest Moon and dared to ask, but what if two guys could fu- Have you ever wanted to live out the millennial fantasy of owning property because a boomer relative died? What about making a physical contribution to society instead of just filling out spreadsheets so a rich capitalist can hoard more wealth? Or maybe even fall in love instead of awaiting the inevitable dawn of the water wars as climate collapse creeps ever closer? Stardew Valley is a cozy farm simulation game about trying to live up to a dead guy's expectations while flirting with everyone and everything that isn't already married. Even then, we can fix that shortcoming with mods. We're gonna be hoeing from dawn till dusk. Each day in Stardew is about 15 minutes real world time, and we're going to be stressing for all 15 of them. Oh, I'm sorry, did you think that cozy game meant that this was easy? No, this is a time management stress test that you're going to spend hours optimizing, and damn it, you're going to love every cozy second of it. A charming Stardew Day consists of any combination of what I like to call the six Fs. Farming, foraging, fishing, fighting, flirting, and fighting rocks, occasionally referred to as mining. <laughs> Stuff like farming is pretty straightforward. You till some soil, slam a few seeds down there, splash some water on it, and boom, profits. And then there's other relaxing activities like fishing. So, with all that established, let's go over. The game starts with us living out the plot of my favorite horror movie office space. But instead of making money through massive fraud, our pop-pop just kicks it instead. He leaves us his farm, which is currently choking with neglect, and tells us to get our life together. Okay, boomer. Not one to spit in the gift horse's mouth, we accept and move to Stardew Valley. From here, we begin the bafflingly fun activity of cleaning up our digital farm. Contrary to every movie featuring a big city type entering a derelict shack, the locals here are actually pretty nice and help us get started. You guys, uh, going camping? We go into town, pick a plant along the way, buy some seeds from the local grocery that makes Whole Foods look reasonable, and then get a sad little garden up and running. After a few days, we settle into our game loop. Five of our six Fs translate directly into the core skills we want to level up to improve our abilities and unlock new stuff. You level up each skill by doing activities related to the skill name. Groundbreaking, I know. You'll want to max out all of them eventually, but you should prioritize them in the order that you find most fun. Farming unlocks items that'll help your plants grow more efficiently, and specialize in making extra money from either animals or crops. Later, it unlocks kegs, which allow us to roleplay as Windsor, Ontario during the 1920s. It also makes the hoe and watering can consume less energy. Mining obviously makes us better at hitting rocks, right? Clearly, it unlocks alchemy. Mining with a pickaxe is the most efficient way to drain your limited energy. Now, this would be a problem if mining was tied to the pickaxe, but guess what? It's tied to the destruction of rocks. You know what's a lot better at destroying rocks than a sharp piece of metal on a stick? So, grab some bombs or a slingshot with explosive pellets. Otherwise, these rocks are going to eat through your energy bar like bodybuilders at the gym. Foraging lets us cast off the shackles of agricultural society and revert to hunter-gatherer. Every Sunday, bushes, trees, and random soil patches will spawn with season-specific crops for you to shake down like a low-level mafioso. Or, if you want to be efficient with the skill, you can simply spend a season harvesting wild seeds from your farm. Foraging is actually really important because it unlocks fast travel items like totems and makes finding limited resources much easier. Combat is very simple. You see thing, you hit thing, you sometimes get item from thing. Different weapons have different strengths and weaknesses, but all of them get the job done. Except daggers. Daggers are trash. The deeper into the combat caves you go, the better the loot, but the stronger the enemies. Fighting enemies can net us a lot of rare items and is also the only viable way to gain access to the rare materials we need to upgrade our tools and craft profit-churning items. The only way. And then there's fishing. Fishing is also important. Every in-game day is going to consist of some mix of this moving forward, with the exception of special event days. And finally, after a long hard day of working the land, it's nice to have someone to come home to. 
Someone who can share in your highs and lows. And the only way to get a significant other in this game is by being a halfway decent human being. So if you're a Reddit user or a League of Legends player, you're probably going to struggle with this part of the game. But don't give up. You can improve and I'm here to help. Now you may be wondering, does this game have a story? Basically, Walmart is trying to drive down Pierre's prices and that's something we can't let stand. You could ally yourself with the garbage corpo slime bags, but don't. They suck. Sure, some of the rewards are great, but come on, you know what's wrong. And look how punchable this guy is. Instead, we focus our efforts on the community center, a derelict hovel infested with magic cup rats called Junimos. Through the power of magic fetch quests, we're able to restore this center and by extension the entire valley to its rightful, uh, glory. But before we can do any of that, we're gonna need money and lots of it. Farming is our primary way of making money, but more important than that, it's how you flex on other members of the Stardew community by painstakingly recreating your perfect farm from Stardew Planner, or deviate from it early on, realize how much work it'll be to fix, and then just start a new farm swearing, this time I'll get it right. For a first playthrough, don't worry too much about your aesthetics. You'll have plenty of space to do everything that you need to do. Instead, focus on getting crops up and running and moving towards automation as soon as possible. Early on, your farm will be where you devote the majority of your energy, but down the line, we want to minimize our time spent in the field so we can focus on grinding other stuff like Robin. Each season has specific crops that can grow during that time. Starting in spring, I like to embrace my Irish roots and focus on potatoes. Once I have enough to last for the famine, I'll establish dominance over several children at an egg festival and switch to strawberries for the rest of the season. Next up is summer and... Hope you finished growing everything you needed to for the community center bundle. Otherwise, get used to this feeling. Oh, did I not mention that you need to donate crops to the community center? That's the whole point of this section. Yeah, make sure that you check what's needed ahead of time and grow the required amount. And in the case of gold star crops, you're going to need good fertilizer and more plots than you'd think. Otherwise, the only gold star you're going to get is this one. Anyway, new season, new you. Each season has its money crop that you can focus on. For summer, blueberries are the best crop for money, but I'm too drunk on potato vodka to focus on profit, so I'll be growing hops to keep this party going going well through the winter. In fall, we're going to cure every UTI in a 10,000 kilometer radius because we're not growing anything but cranberries. Winter is fermentation season since only wild seeds grow, so get to leveling foraging, upgrading tools, and producing more jam and alcohol than my prohibition era grandmother. Each season brings with it new opportunities, challenges, and events to flex on the other villagers. Now, since a season only lasts long enough for zombies to take over the UK, this means you only get a limited amount of time to finish specific tasks for the community center. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck waiting till next year. This is where we finally have to address. Fishing consists of trying to keep this bar around this fish, and the difficulty varies depending on the type of fish you're trying to hook. Some are pretty easy, while others have more complex movements than Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. I took classical violin for a decade and now you all have to suffer. The various fish bundles don't go by season, but by type, which means you'll need to plan out where, when, which season, and in what weather you'll be catching these old demons. This is one of the many reasons why I consider Stardew Valley to be a two-monitor game, one for the game and the other for the wiki page. A final seasonal consideration is foraging. This is something you can do while running from place to place, but try not to get too hung up on it. Remember, farming is still the best way to level foraging. You can also forage through people's trash for rare items and goods. It's only illegal if you get caught. Personally, I don't do this in my playthroughs. My wife, however, I'm the trash man. This should be enough to get you most of the way to finishing the community center and the game's main story. You'll still need things like animals and rare drop items, but you're a big boy girl them. I'm sure you'll figure the rest out on your own. Or just buy what you're missing from the traveling merchant on Friday or Sunday. Now, at this point, we've pretty much covered five of the six Fs, but there's still something missing. Unless you're a true arrow ace giga chad, you'll probably start feeling the itch for human companionship sooner or later. Even then, if you just want a long-term roommate to shack it up dual income style, then have I got the they them for you. Now, just because Robin wants me to know that there are hot shingles in my area, not all the datables are created equal. I could just run down the list of guys, gals, and non-binary pals, but that wouldn't be very interesting. So instead, I'm going to employ a completely hereto before unseen method of ranking something arbitrary, a tier list. But before we get started, two important things things to keep in mind. Firstly, opinions are subjective. And secondly, I am objectively correct. Always. Get in the comments! Alex has big himbo jock energy. What he lacks in literacy, he makes up for in protein consumption. His dreams are as big as his taste in women is bad. Hates quartz and loves breakfast. A tier. 
Sam has a lot of pros and cons. On one hand, he plays in a band, but on the other, he plays in a band. Seems like the kind of guy who has 100 projects on the go, but never actually finishes any of them. His love of rock is only outweighed by his hate of rock. He was a skater boy. I said, see you later, boy. C tier. I barely know Harvey exists. I've never seen a more accurate portrayal of an introverted Portland hipster. Stardew might be idyllic, but Valley be damned if he's going to provide free universal health care. If you have to interact with him, just ply him with coffee and stay away from the beach. And remind yourself, you deserve better. D tier. Elliot might be a vampire. He plays piano, writes sad poetry, and I mean, just look at the guy. This is by no means a deal breaker for me. I just wanted to point it out. Well, I feel like his fiction would insist upon itself. I can't fault someone for putting themselves out there in a very earnest way. What I can fault someone for is kissing me on a boat before I can give consent. You know, they can't refuse because of the implication. B tier. Sebastian is a broody programmer who rots in his basement and only comes out to play Dungeons and Dragons. Oh my god, he's just like me, for real, for real. Besides that, he's the second best thing to come out of Robin, right after my chicken coop. While we both love pumpkin soup, I can't see myself with someone who hates pina coladas, so for that, I have to take a few ranks off. S tier. Oh, Shane. If Red Flags and Microwave Pizza became a person, it would be Shane. This is the aftermath of peaking in high school. I just I feel like I can fix him. You can't fix him. Stop lying to yourself. If you think you can fix him, congratulations, you're the problem. I'm not even going to tell you his likes or dislikes. Actually, you know what? Abigail is the manic pixie goth girl who will help you get over your creative block. She's just so quirky, you know? Playing the flute in the rain and studying the way of the blade in the graveyard. If you want to date someone who's barely an adult, then Abby is your girl. If you didn't win an Oscar for The Revenant, then there are better options. Save yourself the investment in Amethyst, D tier. Emily feels like someone that's just way too deep into astrology. A real free spirit type. That being said, I'm fairly sure she has access to the astral plane via the power of microdosing. While her interpretive dance leaves a lot to be desired, she's a hell of a seamstress and shares my hatred of fish food. Another honest and out there type that I can respect. B tier. Haley. You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. This is awful in every way. F tier. Leah is the closest thing we can get to Robin without mods, so she's automatically S tier. She's got that earnest artistry of Elliot, but with a full understanding of consent. She appreciates a good bottle of wine, but seems to be on keto with the way she hates carbs. Even with the baggage of her ex, S tier. Earlier jokes aside, Maro is pretty great. She's the nerdy girl who turns out to be super cute once she just removes her glasses or takes the scrunchie out of her hair. While she does come with a free nurse's outfit, I do think it looks cuter on her stepbrother. She cares about her mom and dad, which causes her to build Skynet, but other than that, she's pretty smart. Also, she always wants batteries for some reason. A tier. Penny is the trad wife that neckbeards dream of but can never attain because they won't stop harassing her for feet pics. She's great with kids and seems to really care about the townspeople. She likes the finer things but hates alcohol, likely because of her mom. Two shots of vodka. Personally, I think she's kind of boring, but hey, vanilla is the most popular flavor of ice cream for a reason, so B tier. And finally, there's our ace in the hole. For the true garlic bread enthusiasts out there, you can shack it up with Krobus. Enjoy their fine gifts and stellar hugs. There's not much to say about them other than the obvious. Double S tier. And while that's all the romanceable characters, all the other characters in Stardew Valley are great too. I really mean it when I say the NPCs feel more fleshed out than most characters in big budget AAA games. Every resident of Stardew Valley is complicated and interesting in their own right. And one of the things I like most about this game world is you can really see and feel the love and care the developer put into every single one of these characters. Marnie and Lewis's Triss, Kent's struggle with PTSD, even Gus's love of cooking. Almost everyone here is great. Except you, Clint. I'm watching you. Stardew Valley can be a very fun game to optimize but at the end of the day, it's a place that you can escape to and spend a few hours relaxing in. As much as I love watching my money counter go up, I equally enjoy chatting up the NPCs or just messing around with my friends in multiplayer. While there's a lot to get overwhelmed with at first, once you slip into it, this truly is the king of cozy gaming, and I applaud Concerned Ape for making such a wonderful world to spend time in. You might even say it's... Perfection. Okay, baby time is over. Completion of this game is merciless, and I'm not talking about that wimpy statue you get from your grandpa's ghost after year three. I'm talking about everything. If you want to command any respect around here, you need to get that statue of true perfection and put it somewhere where everyone in Stardew Valley can see it. They need to know that you are the one true god of cozy gaming. So how do we reach this pinnacle of gaming achievements? You simply have to do the following. 
Ship every farm forgeable item, max out every skill, build every fast travel obelisk, commit monster genocide, become an extrovert and befriend everyone, find every star drop, cook every meal, craft every item, catch every fish, collect 100 golden walnuts, and finally purchase a clock that was apparently handcrafted by the god Cronus himself for 10 million gold. Then, and only then, can you say you've truly beaten Stardew Valley, at least until another patch comes out. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to do all that for two reasons. Firstly, it wouldn't be very funny. And second, there's no fucking way I'm going to do all of that. So instead, I'm going to teach you the dark art of cheating. If Jojo Mark can be exploitative, so can we. So if you're crazy enough to go for this, here are a few shortcuts. I won't tell if you don't. Shakespeare once pondered, what's in a name? Now, he didn't have the answer because he was stupid, but I do. Rare items. By naming yourself or your animals a numeric index like this, you will be given the corresponding item anytime someone says your name. If we combine this with a phone and continuously call Clint telling him to leave Emily alone, we will have achieved infinite free items. You can also rename yourself after you've progressed the wizard's quest line a little, so you can get whatever items you want this way. Next up, chairs. Chairs in this game can be exploited harder than non-unionized game developers. Getting key items early can slingshot your progress, and chairs allow just that. We can use them to get in and out of the hidden forest, getting us access to hardwood very early on, or we can use them to block people's doors and hop in and out of the rooms at low friendship. Great for stealing shorts, a key ingredient in any suit. Finally, let's talk tea. Using nothing more than the stuff we find on the ground, we're going to disrupt the tea trade harder than the opium wars, all in spring year one. First, we need to shower Caroline with daffodils to gain her trust. After that, we break into a grow ops bond with her over our love of the leaf, and the following day, she'll send us a recipe for tea saplings which we will never plant. Why? Well, if you want to get rich in a gold rush, you don't become a miner. You sell shovels. Let suckers like Carolyn grow the tea, and we'll stick to selling the saplings for insane early game profit. Wait, did we just become Jojomart? There's lots of other things you can do too, like statue duping or mass producing hay so you don't need to rely on Marnie. Marnie, please, my chickens are dying. And much, much more. But this should be enough to get you as far into perfection as you care to go. Anyway. In case it isn't obvious by now, I love this game and I think it's an absolute treat. At the end of the day, Stardew Valley is a great place to relax on your own and it's even better with a few friends thrown in the mix. I love that games like this remind us that it's important to slow down and appreciate the people around us. Appreciate that everyone has their own lives outside of ours, complete with their own aspirations and struggles. There's a lot of different things to do in Stardew Valley and almost everyone is going to find something that they enjoy. Now, I've only scratched the surface of this game. There are so many quests, side areas, and even whole other zones to explore. If I tried to cover everything that's great, this would turn into a Joseph Anderson video. If you want to check out some actually decent Stardew Valley content creators, please check out Salmons and Lumi, and my personal favorite, Charlie Barley. They're all wonderful, links are in the description. And finally, I'm sorry this video took so long to come out. Life has been crazy and Path of Exile exists. I had hoped to put out six videos this year, but at this point that's just not realistic. And also the YouTube algorithm can be fickle and that can be frustrating, but I'm still so grateful for every view that these silly things get. It means a lot to me. The good news is I do have a lot more videos planned for the future, some of which are already in progress. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day and stay safe out there.